Now, our passage this morning in the Old Testament book of Malachi clearly teaches that sinners are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But it actually doesn't use any of those words. Because this was written at a time where we, were, we are still in the Old Testament. The Son of God had not taken on flesh yet and lived his life, died on a cross, or rose again on the third day. Other biblical writings in the Old Testament also mention things about this Messiah, this one to come, and these prophets intently looked into these things, trying to figure out who this person would be and what exactly he would come to accomplish. But it's definitely here in this passage. It just doesn't use those words. And I hope today, this morning, that you are confronted again with both the justice of God, which is perfectly impartial, and the grace of God, which is astoundingly abundant. And more than that, I hope that you can see how when sinners are saved, both of those things, the justice and the grace of God, both work together, and that they're found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then one more thing we're going to discover today is a key ingredient on how God saves sinners. And I know there's a children's song, and I sang it when I was a kid. It says, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. But there's actually something that he cannot do. And it's here that we see this, and it is a reason to sing. So let's read our text today in Malachi chapter 2, verses 17 to chapter 3, verse 6 together. Verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress uh, the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, for I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Now this text actually addresses that age-old question of if God is just, why is there so much injustice in this world? If God is just, then why doesn't he do anything about it? I mean, this question, this dilemma that people have, often when I talk to them uh, outside of the church, they're always asking, well, if God is just, then why is this happening? Why does the world look like it does? But it's even a good question for us in the church to be asking as well. We should be able to answer this. Because for ourselves, we read in the Bible these claims that God is just, and then when we line that up with the reality that we see in this world, how do we answer that question without it being a contradiction? I mean, if, if God is just, we read in Genesis chapter 18, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And then we look around in this world and we wonder why Christians are suffering and being murdered because they confess Jesus as Lord. And those who are persecuting them are getting away with it without any punishment. If the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, it says that all of God's ways are justice, then why do wicked people, people who break God's laws, do evil and they get away with it? If 2 Chronicles says, be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, then how do we understand that the wicked in this world, they not just prevail, they even prosper at times. And if Psalm 92 says, the Lord is upright and there is no unrighteousness in him, then why hasn't God done something about all the injustice that takes place in this world? 
These are the kinds of questions that you should be asking and are probably thinking when you read these kinds of things. How does God's character, this truth that we hear, and our present reality line up so that they don't contradict? Or is one of them right and one of them wrong? At some point or another, you've probably wondered the question in verse 17. It says, where is the God of justice? And this isn't so much a question about his location. They're not asking where he is. They're asking about his character. If you're the God of justice, then where are you? Why aren't you doing something about it? And so it's sort of an accusation that God is not acting with integrity. That if he is just, something should have happened already. And while I think this is a great question that deserves an answer, we should have an answer for this. But sometimes, and often, we actually come to this question with our minds already made up. We look out at the world, we experience, we feel injustice even in our own lives. And when we ask this question, we've already actually decided that God can't be just because our present reality tells us that he must not be. And this this causes us to do what my kids do on a long road trip. When we drive to Vancouver the last couple of years, back to see our family, along the way, it takes roughly 10 hours to do this. And so let's say we're eight hours in, and my kids, of course, they're going to ask. They've already asked before. But at this point, they'll say, are we there yet? When are we going to be there? And I tell them. I'm thinking, okay, we've been eight hours. There's only two hours left. I say, we'll we'll be there soon. But soon to them means five, maybe seven minutes. And so they let that time go by, and then every time the clock changes, every minute, they're asking, are we there yet? Why aren't we there yet? You said it would be soon. It's been soon. Why aren't we there yet? Because what they're doing is they're interpreting the word soon. I meant it to mean two hours. They meant it to mean five minutes. And, And the more that they dwell on this, that their definition is right and mine is wrong, they might actually accuse me of lying to them. And then an hour goes by, they ask again, when are we there? I say, soon. And they don't even believe me anymore. (laughs) And I think this is where that question in verse 17 comes from. That these people are are looking around them. They're seeing all the injustice. They know the promises of God and who he claims to be. But they look around and they say, well, if justice, if he says he's just, then where is he? Why isn't he doing doing anything about it? What they're thinking is about their own definition. We all know what the word justice means, but we've applied our definitions to how God should act, what speed he should be executing justice with, and then we look at him and we say, he's not just because he's not doing that. But we need to allow God's word to help us understand what he means by the word justice. And so what we need to see here this morning is that even though we've probably all had this thought that if, if I were God, I would have done something about this by now. Instead of thinking that way, we need to let him respond. He hasn't met our expectations, but he may not be doing it our way. So let's find out how God responds and how he defends his justice and even defends why it's delayed, at least according to our our idea. So the beginning of chapter 3 is where he, he gives us his answer. And the first thing he does is he tells them he's coming. Now look at verse 1. He starts with, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So at that point, we already know that he is coming. He wouldn't send a messenger to prepare the way if he wasn't going to come. So that's the first thing. We need to see this. The second thing is, at the end of verse 1, it says, Behold, again, behold, he is coming. He says it again. And it seems to me that the people who begin to doubt whether God is truly just or not might also begin to doubt whether he's actually going to come back, whether actually actually he's going to do anything. I mean, maybe you've had the temptation or maybe you've actually legitimately believed or thought to yourself, you know, maybe I look around this world, maybe God isn't just. Maybe he doesn't really care about how I live my life. Maybe he won't come back to make all these wrongs right again. And so what he says here to answer the question of where is the God of justice, he says, I'm coming. Then in verse 2, when he comes, no one is safe. Look at verse 2. The questions, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? And this isn't so much a question. They're not trying to find out, well, which one of us can do this. It's just making the statement, no one 
will survive this. No one will stand. No one will endure. When God comes to judge, everyone is guilty. The Bible tells us this over and over again, that all are guilty. All are sinful. Every one of us has broken God's laws. We have not kept it perfect, and therefore every single one of us is not innocent, and we will not stand. I mean, Romans 3 clearly teaches us that none is righteous, no, not one. It also says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. This we believe in this church. We are all sinful. And for no other reason, when we think about the justice of God, if He says He's coming to bring justice, then we need to understand that our sin is the reason why this day would be dreadful. He is coming, and He will judge all. Other places where it talks like this is Psalm 130. It points out, If you, O Lord, o Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? Again, the standing is that you stand before God, and everyone who is judged no longer is standing. They will not stand. They will not survive. They will not last His judgment. They will be condemned. They will not stand. Again, in Revelation 6, it describes this day as the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? When I look at my life, I know that I cannot, not by my own deeds. And verse 5 tells us the criteria. If we jump down to verse 5, it tells us that he will draw near to you for judgment. And when he does, it says he will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, and the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear him. This list is descriptive in in some ways but it's also very general the last phrase there where it says those who do not fear god that is the general principle here of people who will not stand you don't fear god things like uh, sins like adultery and like lying are just the symptoms of a heart that does not fear god This is about the heart. And religion that is acceptable to God, religion that He finds pure, is more about the heart than anything else. Do you remember when that rich religious man came to Jesus? And He asked them, He says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, Keep the commandments. You know, do not murder, do not commit adultery. And this man indicates here that he's kept all of these commands since he was a youth since he was a child. And then Jesus responds, and he says this in Mark chapter 10. You lack one thing. He says, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And we learn that he didn't do this. And the reason why was because he had great possessions, and his heart loved wealth more than God. So he may have externally tried to show that he loved God, that he obeyed God, but internally in his heart, he didn't fear God. And he still didn't have eternal life. If he had actually kept all the laws, why didn't Jesus say, well, you're done, good job, you have eternal life. But Jesus asked this question, exposing his heart more than just his behavior. And like this man, this rich young man, we need to also test our own inclinations The temptation in our hearts is strong to make us think about the things that we've done or maybe the things that aren't so bad in in the end. And we think, you know, before God, I'll probably be able to make it. I'm, I'm not that bad. And maybe I will be able to stand. But that is a temptation. It's not the truth. We need to really think about our own hearts more than what our hands have done, but what our hearts have loved. And the claim that everyone is a sinner is is pretty easily figured out because Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And based on that command alone, we are all rightly condemned. And James chapter 2 reminds us that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. What God's looking for is perfect obedience. Not 90%, not 99%. He doesn't mark on a curve. He's looking for perfection. That's what our Creator demands of us. And none of us can say that we are perfectly obedient. So amidst all the injustice in the world today, we look around, we say, those people are wicked. 
God, why don't you punish them? Why don't you give them what they deserve? Why don't you come and make all these things that are wrong, make them right? And that's a good God-given desire that every single one of us has. We've all felt that before. We've all felt injustice and wanted God to do something about it. And often we take matters into our own hands. But if God is just, then where is he? But we must also recognize that we too, if God comes and judges us all this very moment, we too, in our hearts, have that same wickedness. Have that same sin problem that will condemn us all. So when we look outward, it's easy to condemn people and say, we need justice now. But when we look inward, we are kind of glad that God hasn't judged yet. That there's still time. See, the problem that religion has in many different ways is that when it, when it fails, where it fails is that it judges people, either good or bad, it labels them like that based on what they have done. And religion like this won't save you from hell. It just gives you a label. It doesn't actually deal with your sin. It's like a doctor that, that you go to the doctor and you tell them your symptoms. He says, okay, this is, what you're, this is what's happening. Well, you need to stop all of that. Just stop the symptoms and it'll all go away. So let's say you're about to have a heart attack. And this doctor, what religion would tell you is, okay, just wipe that cold sweat off your brow. Just don't, don't, don't take short breaths. Take big breaths. Just try to get through that. And don't let that pressure in your chest slow you down. Just live your life like it's not there. That's how religion works when it's only about our behaviors. But what religion that God accepts, like I said, is from the heart. He wants to deal with the actual problem, not just the sinful symptoms. And in the end, that kind of religion, if it's just about what you do or what you've done, it doesn't actually rescue you from the condemnation of your sin. It just changes the way you live from that point on. But in the end, all you're doing is changing symptoms. You're not actually healing the sickness. Any changes that you have made in your life, thinking about perhaps the judgment of God, you think, okay, I don't want that. Something's got to change. If you've made some changes, if you changed your behaviors, if you've done th certain things, if you've done some good works, thinking that will help you, if you have certificates from your baptism or your church membership or even Bible college, none of those things actually remove the guilt of sin. That's the problem. And because God is just, that has to be dealt with before anyone will be allowed to get into heaven. And so when you stand before your maker's throne on the day of judgment, and the books are opened, and everything that you've ever thought or done or said or even loved in your hearts, it's all laid bare. Every single one of us, you, myself, and every human being will be rightly condemned. This is what Malachi is saying, that no one is safe when God shows up. No, not one. And so the first thing we need to understand that Malachi is saying here, and the entire Bible tells us, is that God's unchanging justice guarantees a sinner's condemnation. It's because God is just that sinners must be condemned. And too often we look at the wicked people or those people that are doing that over there and we don't look inwards and we see ourselves. But God's justice never changes and it will condemn every sinner. And there's no way around this. The Bible tells us that, that in Romans chapter 2, God shows no partiality. When he judges, there is no distinctions that he makes. He's looking for perfection. Not where you were born or who you were. Not what church you attended or for how long. Not how much Bible knowledge you have, or even if you were involved with bringing thousands of people to Christ. It doesn't save you. It's wonderful, but it doesn't take away the guilt of your sins. In Galatians chapter 2, it states that a person is not justified by works of the law. There's nothing that you or I can do that will actually change our condemnation. We cannot do it. The Bible describes the person who expects that something within themselves, perhaps their own goodness, perhaps some of the good deeds that they've had, the person that goes into judgment thinking like they've got the ace, they've got it, they'll just show God these things or remind him of those good things that they did, and they stand before him, the, per the Bible says that that person is cursed because it will never work. They're expecting it to, but they'll never work. And the Bible doesn't think this is a secret. 
I mean, it tells us this plainly, that we are all under a curse. And when it comes to judgment, there's no excuse. There's no bribe that you can give to God that will change his mind from giving you the unquenchable wrath against our sin. That's why I say that God's justice is unchanging. We are all doomed. And that's the bad news of the Bible. And it's really bad news, especially because God won't change. He won't change based on what we've done. And when we wonder where the God of justice is, he says he's coming. That should scare us. Because in our own, on our own, in our own deeds, we have nothing to get us out of condemnation. And I hope I haven't lost any of you yet. I know this is all bad news. But this prepares us for the good news. That, it, that if we don't understand that we're sinful, then who needs to be saved? And what we're saved from is not actually specifically Satan or something about him. It's actually that we're saved from God himself. It's his justice that demands our condemnation, our punishment. And so somehow we need to pay that off so that he has nothing left to condemn, condemn us for. And to those who have heard this many times before, perhaps you've heard this over and over and over again, that you are a sinner, that we need to be saved from our sins, all of this kinds of stuff. What we need is to be reminded again of how terrible how dreadful the day of the Lord will actually be. That our sin is, is not inconsequential, even as Christians. We need to know that it is, as Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, He is our Savior, but He is a fearful person. We need to fear Him so Christians aren't supposed to be unaware of this bad news. In fact, only those who grasp God's justice like this, only those who understand how sinful we really are, only they are ready to see how salvation can be, can be purchased, can be earned by Christ for us. They see how it works, that by grace through faith we can have forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus and Jesus alone. And this is where I want to look next. You're probably wondering why I skipped a few verses, where I went all the way to verse 5 when I missed a few. But the reason is because verse 5 is going to happen to everybody. That, that day is coming. If you jump over to chapter 4, verse 1, it describes it with frightening imagery. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will, not, or it will leave them neither root nor branch. So this day is coming for all of us. But before we get to that day in verse 5, Malachi describes the coming of the Lord in a different way. In verse 1, it tells of a messenger whom God is sending. This messenger will prepare the way for the Lord, and when he comes, this word for behold means look Look for him, pay attention, and when he comes, the Lord won't be far behind him. But notice something in verse 1. There's a shift that takes place. First, he starts by saying, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So God is talking, and he's talking about himself. Me, I, my. And then the language shifts. It, it switches to the third person. And he starts talking about himself, but in another person. It says he refers to himself as the Lord. So the Lord is talking and he says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He's talking now out, kind of outside of himself. And he calls himself the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. First it was I am coming. And then he says he is coming. So the Lord is coming, but we expect it in one way in verse 5, but he's actually coming in a different way. And this figure is divine. He is the Lord, but he's also the messenger of the covenant. And he's coming early, earlier than judgment. So verse 2 then gives us an idea of who he is. It describes him like this. He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He is pure. He is 
completely pure and holy. And he comes, and he's like a refiner's fire. So he's like the fire that refines people, or like the soap that cleans garments. And so that will be his role. Look at verse 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. That's what he will do. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and like silver. So this divine messenger is not only the messenger of the covenant, this covenant that will purify everyone who is included in it. He's not just the messenger. He is also the purifier, the one who does the work. And so in view of God's unchanging justice, which we've already seen, we now see that it is condemned sinners who see this covenant, this messenger who is coming of the covenant, and see that there is a way that they can be saved. And the reason is, is because all of our sin, all of our wickedness, our impurity within ourselves needs to be purified or our judgment will remain upon us. This this messenger of the covenant. The Lord himself is coming, but first he will come and he will purify his people. And what a sinner should think at that moment is to say, I need that. That's the covenant that I need to be a part of. And we see that it isn't coming from within people, from within ourselves. It's coming from without. It's not from man. It's from God. It's not given because of our own goodness. It's given because of God's grace. And it's not something that we have to earn. It's something that we would, would receive through faith. And the work of the messenger of the covenant is effective. Look at verse 3. Look at the results. And they, so these sinners, no one can stand. Not even the sons of Levi as it refers to here. But then after he's purified them, it says, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Something has changed. Look at, look at verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord. So the result will be that instead of dishonoring and disobedience to God, it will be pleasing and obedient to God. This is how effective the purifying is. And when we become accepted by God and righteous before Him and pleasing to Him, there is no more condemnation. If there was any left... He would say, you are condemned. I don't find any pleasure in you. But because it's been gone, it's been taken away, we have been refined to the point where, like silver, all the impurities have been burned away, and all that's left is purely that precious metal. That's the work of this messenger who comes. Now, fast forward 400 years. This is the last book of the New Testament. And it says, behold, my messenger is coming not only to prepare the way, but also of the covenant. And we see that John the Baptist is used or is referred to by Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. The, all the gospel writers go to that verse to identify who John the Baptist is. He is the messenger who prepares the way. And everyone knew in that day that when the messenger showed up proclaiming that the king was coming, it wouldn't be long. They had to ready themselves immediately because the time was coming. He was coming. His coming was at hand. But instead of the typical messenger that would come and prepare the road, so he would, he, would, he would be like a construction worker, filling potholes and leveling everything so the king could arrive safely. He would ensure that the king would get there, and he'd go into the cities and tell the people, the king is coming. Get ready. So there might be banners. There might be other things. But the people would ready themselves so that the king would come and find them acceptable not just busy doing whatever they want or even doing things that are against the law that this king had put into place. He'd ready the people. He'd ready the way. But what we find John doing here is he's actually preparing hearts. He, he calls people to repentance because of sin. See, this kind of messenger was not what they expected. But this is what Jesus came to first do. The Lord has come. He comes, but it's in the form of a man. We see him in Jesus, and he is the messenger of the new covenant. You remember what he spoke about at, at the Last Supper with his disciples. He talked about the new covenant. But not only would he bring the new covenant, the message of the new covenant, he also established it in his body and in his blood. He told his disciples this. And then hours later, he was crucified for sins that he didn't commit. So the Son of God not only brought the message of the covenant, He didn't just tell us about it, He established it in Himself. And since the justice of God demanded perfect 
obedience, he lived sinlessly for his entire human life for those who are condemned. And because God's justice demands that we be punished for our sins, he on the cross died in a way that that bore our sin, that bore the punishment that we all deserve, paying it off in full on our behalf. And because the punishment is death for sinners, for sin, Jesus conquers death, removes its sting, and he rises from the dead on the third day. This is how the messenger of the covenant comes and purifies his people. And since this was done in Malachi, we see here that yes, the Lord is coming to judge the living and the dead, and every single one of us, no matter who we are, is condemned already by our sin. But before he comes to judge the world, this is the promise here. Do you see it? He comes graciously to save the world. And by faith, every sinner here today is offered the gift of God. The gift is Christ. Christ's death, which is a full payment for all of your sins, to be paid in full, that there's no wrath left for God to give us, because there's no sin left for God to condemn us. It's also Christ in that His perfect obedience in this life. He lives sinlessly. And it meets the requirements of God. He wants us to be perfect. He demands it. And so Christ lived perfectly on our behalf. And that by faith in Christ, some miraculous and mysterious way, we, are, we give our sins to Christ. And He has already paid for them all. And what we receive from Him is His perfect obedience. So that when the day of judgment comes, we are purified. We can stand there and He looks at us and He condemns us because of our deeds. But we say, Christ has died for all my sins. And I have the righteousness of Christ, and he will honor that. That's how the gospel works. There is terrible news, but there is wonderful good news. The verse in the Bible, which we all know, it begins with the bad news. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it immediately continues with the good news. We can't stop there. It says, And are justified... By His grace, as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We we see this all as we think about the gospel. And it says, whom God, Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. So that is the gospel. That's the good news. And here's how it deals with the justice of God. God's not sweeping this under the rug. He's not looking the other way. He's not making it not matter. He's actually dealing with his justice. It says this was to show God's righteousness, or in other words, his justice, because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. So we've asked the question, where is God? Why isn't he doing anything? He's overlooking, it seems. His divine forbearance passed over former sins. But he is righteous. It was to show his righteousness, his justice at the present time, so that he might be just, his justice hasn't gone anywhere, but also the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And so what this tells us is that the justice of God remains intact. It's his justice that condemns us, but it's his grace that satisfies his justice. Do you see how this works? There is unchanging Uh, justice of God, which condemns every sinner. And the second thing is that God's unchanging grace guarantees a sinner's justification. So it is God that must be appeased, and God himself, in his Son, appeases his own wrath for sinners like us. So remember, your impurities, the sin, the wickedness in your life, is the reason why you are condemned. And we all have this. We all need to get this uh, gone, uh, rid of. And to escape God's judgment, you must be purified. And so the work of Jesus on the cross is the only way to refine you. The only way that actually deals with the issue. He removes our guilt. And he does it. Although it cost him a great cost, he offers it to us for free. It is the gift of God. And to everyone who confesses, anyone in this room that confesses that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. 
And we will all go through the fire of God's justice in the last day. But if we go through the fire, the refining fire now, before that day, we will be purified and we will endure. We will stand in that day. So here, this, this promise, this, what the Lord is telling us about his justice, he says he's coming. Trust in the refining fire of Jesus Christ to purify you from your sins today or you will be destroyed in the consuming fire of God tomorrow. So church, verse 6 is where your confidence should lie. Look at verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And I said before that there was something that God cannot do. He cannot change. And that is good news. That's what keeps us from the day of judgment or sustains us in the day of judgment. That nothing will change. Yes, His justice will continually condemn sinners to hell forever. But His grace, His unchanging grace, His faithfulness to the promise of those who have been included in this covenant by faith, He will purify sinners for eternity in heaven. And because He will never change, you can trust this promise. You can trust in the work of Christ for your forgiveness and eternal life today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a great and majestic king. You deserve all the honor. You are worthy of all praise and glory. And we are so small in your sight. And yet, because of your justice, we are condemned rightly, And yet, because of your grace, we are saved. We are rescued. And it's not that it costs you nothing, but that you sent your Son to pay the price that we could never pay so that we can stand and be at peace with you. That when you look at us, there is not wrath against us. There is reconciliation. There is peace. There is love. And what you see in us is Christ. So we thank you for Christ. We thank you that although we know we deserve to rightly be punished forever in hell from your unquenchable wrath, we know that through Christ, because you never change, you will be faithful to every single one of us who put our faith, who put our trust in his work on our behalf. And you will purify us, not only in an instant when we believe, but also throughout our lives, through, through the testing of our faith, through the suffering that we go through, and even the injustice that goes on in this world, you are purifying us continually. This is why you sent your Spirit at Pentecost, to give every one of your people the ability to stand, not only in the day of judgment, but also now. And that we would look forward to that day when we would go through judgment untouched by the flames of your wrath. And that we will enter eternity because of Christ and Christ alone. May we not look to our own deeds or perhaps our own goodness to make us think that we are good enough in your sight. But may we look to Christ, the purifier, the perfecter of our faith. And and rest in him, finding refuge from your wrath in him alone. Thank you, Father for adopting us as your children by your grace and giving us life, life eternal. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.